Say, have you ever heard the, the story about the three pastors who lived in the same town? There was a, a Baptist minister, a Methodist minister, and a Lutheran minister who, well, became rather close to one another. They played golf together, met for coffee, and so forth. At any rate, one day they decided it might be a, a good idea to go on a two-day retreat together to study and to discuss their preaching and, you know, to just get to know one another better and strengthen their bond as fellow ministers of the gospel in their community. During their retreat, their relationship evolved to the point that they began to, well, really open up with one another and, and share deeply with one another about their inner life. The Baptist minister said, Brothers, I have to confess that I really wrestle with the sin of greed. I am ashamed to admit it, but for the past several months, I've been dipping into the weekly collection. Please pray for me. Well, the Methodist minister, he spoke up. Brother, he said, I understand that kind of uncontrollable urge. My problem is lust. I simply cannot keep my eyes off of a certain beautiful woman, and I'm afraid that my lust is going to go beyond just looking. The Lutheran minister was very quiet, thinking deeply while the two other guys looked at him, waiting for him to share his confession. Finally, he broke down. I'm sorry, he said, but guys, I've got to tell you that my sin is that of gossip. And I just can't wait to get to a telephone. <laughs> Dear friends in Christ, today I want to talk to you about what I believe is our most common sin. So what do you suppose it might be? Greed? No. Lust? No. Ah, how about gossip? No, it's actually not that either. Now certainly all of those things are common, sadly, as well as spiritually damaging. But our most common sin is, well, that which we saw illustrated today here in our epistle reading from James chapter 2. In that reading, James talked about the sin of showing partiality. That is, making a judgment of a person based strictly on their outward appearances. In this reading, James uses the example of clothing, contrasting a person dressed in shabby clothing to that of a person dressed in fine, expensive clothing. And then James calls out his readers who would give preferential treatment to the one dressed in fine, expensive clothing while treating the poorly dressed individual with disdain and contempt. Of course, today we are well beyond doing that sort of thing, right? Wrong. No, we still struggle with that sin of showing partiality by judging others. Not only judging them by the clothing they may be wearing, but also by things like that of, say, the color of their skin. Or perhaps the number of piercings and tattoos that may be on their body. Or the amount of education they have achieved or not achieved. Or their a political affiliation, and any number of things like that. Oh, and by the way, don't be fooled. This showing partiality like that, it, it really does work both ways. I've witnessed, for example, on many a, an occasion, uh, the poor making judgments on the rich. You know how it goes. Well, we think since that man lives in a big house and drives a big fancy car and wears real nice clothing, he therefore must be a rich snob who cares only about himself. Yes, the sin of partiality, it affects 
all of us. No matter what our situation or standing in life may be. And you know the reason why that is so is because the sin of partiality is really just a symptom of a much bigger problem. You see, our most common sin is not actually the sin of showing partiality. Remember, I had said that the reading from James simply illustrates for us our most common sin. No, my friends, what lies at the root of something like that of showing partiality, indeed, what lies at the root of many of the sins we find ourselves committing is that of self-righteousness. Yes, self-righteousness is our most common sin. Or if you want to give it another label, that of unhealthy pride. If you look closely, James actually identifies that root problem for us here in this epistle reading by revealing something that we often forget about as Christian people. And that is how it is that we came to be saved in the first place. You see, not a single one of us entered into God's kingdom by our own merits. It makes absolutely no difference who you are. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, uh, male, female, Jew, Gentile, black, white, good, bad, Democrat, Republican. No, the only way anyone can enter God's kingdom is solely by his grace. James actually highlights that fact here for us. There in verse 5. Look at verse 5 of this reading. Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? You know, that is a key verse here in this reading. Has not God chosen those who are poor in this world. Don't you see? That's referring to you. That's referring to me. That's referring to us. I mean, stop and think of what your status was before God chose you to be his own. Before he created in you that wonderful gift of faith to believe and trust in him, before he declared you to be an heir of his kingdom. Yes, just think of what you once were. And look, if you're having trouble remembering what you once were, which is easy for us to do, then let the Bible help you in that. The Apostle Paul, for instance, he says in the book of Ephesians, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. The disciple John writes in the book of Revelation, you say, I am rich, I have, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Why, even back there in the Old Testament, King David wrote, surely I was sinful at birth sinful from the time my mother conceived me. You know, my friends, it is Bible verses like those that inspired hymn writers like Charlotte Elliott, who wrote that hymn, Just As I Am, to include uh, lyrics like those that say, Just As I Am, Poor, Wretched, Blind. You remember singing that just a moment ago there? It was in stanza four. Just as I am, poor, wretched, blind. Because you see, spiritually speaking, that, that really was our condition before, before God lovingly intervened into our lives and graciously brought us into his kingdom. Ah, 
But friends, when we forget about that, which we can so easily do, well, that's when this thing called self-righteousness starts to creep back in. And we start thinking of ourselves, well, more highly than we ought. And of course, when we think of ourselves more highly than we ought, we start to, to do things like making comparisons and, and judgments. Just as James warned us here in this epistle reading not to do. You know, self-righteousness not only has a way of separating us from others, like when we show that kind of partiality that elevates ourselves and our kind above others, but even worse yet, it also separates us from the God who loves us. Yes, self-righteousness separates us from God because, you see, when you get right down to it, well, the self-righteous individual actually has no need of God, right? At least no need for the, the one true God of Holy Scripture who tells us in his word that we have no righteousness of our own and that forgiveness and salvation comes to us solely by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. You know, the self-righteous individual is like the uh, fellow who, who lived up in the mountains and established this great reputation for himself as an excellent marksman. Yes, whoever followed him around would find target rings on trees, on, on fences, on the sides of buildings with a bullet hole right smack there in the center. Asked to explain the secret of his extraordinary skill, he answered, why, it's easy to hit the bullseye. I just shoot, and then I draw a circle around the hole. <laughs> well, in reality, that's what the self-righteous individual does. They, they, not God, they determine what is good, right, and salutary, and then they, they draw, what, maybe religiosity around it, and they say, look, look, see what I have done. Why, it is easy to be a good disciple. Dear friends, self-righteousness is a problem that affects all of us. Like I said, it's our most common sin. Really, it is. Indeed, it's at the root of many other sins that that manifest themselves in our lives. So what's the remedy to this problem of self-righteousness? Well, first of all, you know, we've got to quit shooting first and then drawing the target later. And a lot of us, we tend to live our lives just like that, where we, we just do as we please in life, whatever our sinful natures may desire to do, and then we try and make it fit into what we might think is an acceptable form of Christianity. For instance, take the third commandment. We neglect worship in favor of doing other activities. But then, well, we justify that breaking of that commandment by saying, well, at least I attend worship more often than a lot of other people do. Or we, we hold a grudge against someone, perhaps even hating them. But then we justify it by saying, well, God knows my special circumstance here. He knows what that, what that person has put me through. Therefore, God doesn't really expect me to love my enemy in, in this particular situation. You see how that works? Yes, the first thing to addressing this problem of self-righteousness is to quit watering down God's holy law so that it now comfortably fits into our flawed understanding of what we think the Christian faith ought to look like. Ah, but friends, as you do that, beware. Beware, because you will soon discover 
that God's holy law is much more, much more than you and I can uphold on our own. I mean, James reminds us of just that. He says there in that reading, whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. Needless to say, God's standard for keeping his law is nothing short than that of perfection. So what you and I need, besides an honest confession of our inability to keep God's holy law, is a Savior. That is, one who has not failed at any point in keeping the law. One who has, in fact, kept the entire law perfectly for us, in our place. And that one Savior is, of course, Jesus. It is Jesus. Yes, my friends, our most common sin may be that of self-righteousness. And it can manifest itself in our lives in a variety of really ugly ways including that of showing partiality, as this reading from James here points out to us. But dear friends, thank goodness. Thank goodness the God of Scripture shows no partiality. Rather, His grace and mercy extends to all who humble themselves before Him by confessing their sins and then trusting in His free and full forgiveness. And you know, it is with that, that spirit of humility that we are then able to truly love and welcome and serve others as Christ loves and welcomes and serves us. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding Guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.